Welcome everyone to this Rotherham Taylor webinar. Our subject today is do crypto assets get taxed? So just a few housekeeping points. This webinar is being recorded um, and an on-demand version will be available. Um, it should be ready tomorrow. We will take questions at the end of the webinar. So if you can put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box and we'll pick them up um, once we've done with the presentation. And we will aim to finish by 7 p.m. So we'll just see how many questions we can fit in before we get to that time. So my name's Simone Smith. I'm the tax manager at Rotherham Taylor Chartered Accountants. We're a firm based in Preston, which is in the northwest of England. I'm a chartered tax advisor and I've been working in accountancy and taxation for 15 years. My specialisms are with owner managed businesses and all things personal tax related, which means I can ensure that our clients are utilising all available allowances and reducing their tax liabilities as much as possible while ensuring they are correctly declaring um, their returns to HMRC. I'm joined today by Ben Anderson. Ben um, has over 20 years experience as a tax lawyer and barrister and started his career working in the corporate and international departments of big four firms. He's worked as senior in-house tax counsel for a number of large financial institutions and investment banks and was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2011. Ben undertakes litigation and advises on tax in all areas of taxation but he's got a particular interest in cryptocurrency advice and litigation. So I'm very pleased to have him here with us today. I'm also joined by Asim, who's an associate solicitor at Mackerel with the crypto consultancy and blockchain team. And he's got a professional background as a litigation and dispute resolution lawyer. Asim has a particular interest in regulatory compliance and business law within the blockchain and crypto assets industry and has a long-standing hobbyist interest in crypto and digital assets. Recently, Asim has assisted a number of clients with legal issues based in the crypto sphere, so he's actually placed to advise us on the real-world issues of crypto today. So we're going to start with a brief introduction from Ben. Ben, would you mind telling us how crypto got started? I'm sure we all know um, the big picture, but sometimes it's just interesting to hear the history behind it. Yeah, sure. Uh, Bitcoin was originally created by the anonymous cryptographer Satoshi Nakamoto, who mined the Genesis block on 3 January 2009. Bitcoin is a decentralized online currency and it uses blockchain technology that in turn uses cryptography to secure integrity of the ledger. In its early days, it was traded by cryptographic fans trading amongst themselves. And then in 2013, it came to widespread public attention for all the wrong reasons. The FBI shut down the notorious drug trafficking syndicate Silk Road, and it came to light as part of their investigation that members of that syndicate were paying one another in Bitcoin. And ever since that time, it has been unfairly associated with illegal activity. Uh, that triggered a congressional committee inquiry, and as part of that inquiry, Ben Bernanke, who was then chairman of the US Federal Reserve, wrote a letter to that committee in which he expressed cautious optimism about the potential for cryptocurrency and blockchain technology to offer an alternative to the current traditional banking model. And this has started a this has spawned a startup industry in London, San Francisco, and beyond. Uh, intent on disrupting the current traditional banking model. So what do we hear so much about cryptocurrency on a day-to-day -day basis? The first reason is that it offers an alternative to the current traditional banking model. The current traditional banking model is depicted in the 2009 diagram on the left. It has a central bank at its heart and a network of trusted banks that around it. When you go into a, a shop to pay for a of service, you know that the correct amount will be collected from your debit account. And the merchant knows that the correct amount will be credited to their account because there is a chain of trusted financial intermediaries that sit between you and the merchant that ensure the integrity of that transaction. The problem with the trusted financial intermediaries is that they levy very high fees, in some cases foreign exchange transactions, as much as 20% of the transaction. 
a cryptocurrency blockchain payment model does away with the need for financial intermediaries. It is a decentralized network in which the ledger is secured through the use of cryptographic techniques. The fact that it doesn't need trusted financial intermediaries means lower transaction costs, and that means lower price goods and services, and that is very attractive from a consumer point of view. That is the first reason we hear so much about cryptocurrency on a day-to-day -day basis. The second reason is that cryptocurrency is increasingly seen as an investment. Uh, it is a, acting as a hedge against inflation. Uh, the chief investment officer at Fidelity recently cited it as a hedge against inflation, and it is increasingly being seen in the market that way. It doesn't have the long tested history that gold does as, a, as acting as a hedge against inflation. Uh, and it, it does remain to be seen how this will play out. But in terms of the here and now, it is being perceived as the digital gold, a hedge against inflation. And this is the second reason we hear so much about cryptocurrency on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks, Ben. You can see why some people have been a bit wary of crypto in the past. But I think we can all agree that it's starting to gain trust now and it is becoming more widely used out in the, in the real world. Um, so a sim. Would you um, be able to just explain a few of these real world issues to us? Yeah, sure. So as touched on previously by yourself and Ben, uh, crypto is gradually becoming more mainstream. And we have certainly noticed the marked increase in individuals and businesses seeking to liquidate crypto and other digital assets into fiat in the past 12 to 18 months. Although there is a, a diehard segment of the crypto community that advocates that crypto should not be thought of in terms of fiat and should be valued in terms of its own intrinsic value. The reality is that we're a long way of that being a reality for the day-to-day -day person, if ever. And for most people, crypto will at some point need to come back into their control as fiat. The increase of people and businesses seeking to liquidate crypto into fiat raises a number of practical issues. For example, finding an effective off-ramp method. A few years ago, there were very limited avenues available to those seeking to off-ramp from crypto into fiat. Now there are an increasing number of players in the market, a more competitive market, and the number of choices available for those seeking to off-ramp have increased. So it's important that any individual or business looking to off-ramp from crypto is comfortable with the chosen off-ramping avenue that, 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 they have, that they have decided to proceed with. Also, another consideration is ensuring that the off-ramping process happens in good time. And this is of particular importance for those who are seeking to make a time-sensitive purchase from their gains. Uh, for example, a property purchase. It is important for individuals and businesses to have an off-ramping strategy and be comfortable with the avenues and timeframes as well to off-ramp. The other issue directly relates to the time it can take the off-ramp. So off-ramping rarely happens in one transaction or one fell swoop, especially when we're talking about significant sums. A lot of exchanges limit accounts by maximum withdrawal limits, either on a daily or a weekly or a monthly basis. And so it's common to see off-ramping occur in multiple separate transactions over the course of a few days to months. In that time period, it's important to be able to preserve the value of the portfolio from the volatile fluctuations in the crypto market. And anyone who's in crypto knows how volatile the market can be. Uh, a common way of mitigating this is by the use of stable coins, which simply put our cryptocurrencies that peg their value to an external reference, for example, the US dollar. The next issue is more of a practical point but it's important to ensure that the bank account your chosen exchange will be sending fiat funds into is comfortable with accepting funds derived from crypto. It's not unheard of for individuals to have their banking facilities frozen because they've received funds from, they've, they've received funds from a crypto exchange and the funds derived from crypto. And it can be a slow, painful road to reinstate banking facilities. And I'm particularly mind of a client that I worked with who had their banking facilities frozen for well over a year, which caused significant disruption and inconvenience to their operation. One of the main issues is, insurance that, is ensuring that tax liability arising from the gains has been accounted for properly. And it's surprising how many individuals and businesses can completely forget that there will be a tax liability 
and that the funds that they thought they would have available to them will be less than expected because of this. As such, it's important to keep consideration of tax planning in mind when off-ramping and have a tax planning strategy. As the famous saying goes, death and taxes are certain, and crypto is no different. It's well known now that HMRC have contacted a number of crypto exchanges that operate in the UK to request customer data. This was followed by letters from HMRC to crypto investors encouraging them to review their tax affairs. And whilst crypto is decentralized, it's not anonymous. A lot of people can be confused because the two terms were used so interchangeably for many years when talking about crypto. So it's important to keep in mind that if the taxman wants to find you, they will, and it is much better to address tax issues head on and make tax planning an integral part of your off-ramping process and strategy. There's still a significant amount of misunderstanding and confusion in relation to tax liability arising from crypto assets. And so certain practical points to consider would be to consider what constitutes a taxable event within your crypto activity and whether any losses can be offset against realized gains. This highlights the importance of seeking tax advice early and making tax planning an integral part of your off-ramping strategy. That's great. Thanks, Asim. There's certainly a lot of potential issues with crypto, specifically those um, revolving around tax calculation and reporting. So, Ben, would you mind talking talk us through what seems to be a potential minefield? Yeah, uh, thanks, Simone. Uh, essentially, there are three different possibilities for the way cryptocurrency can be taxed. Uh, the first is that a gain or loss could be a gambling gain or loss. Uh, every taxpayer who makes a gain would like to say it's a gambling gain because gambling gains are tax free. As we'll see in a minute, it's very difficult for a taxpayer to maintain that their gain is a gambling gain and can be treated tax free. The second possibility is that a gain or loss is a trading gain or loss. Uh, many taxpayers who make a loss would like to say it's a trading loss because trading losses are, more, are, are generally a little bit, bit more easy to utilise. Again, for most taxpayers, this will not be the correct treatment. At the very least, they have to be doing this activity on a full-time basis, and most taxpayers trading cryptocurrency aren't doing the activity on a full-time basis. The third possibility is that the gain or loss is a capital gain or loss. And for most taxpayers, this will be the correct treatment. Uh, capital gains are taxed at the concessional rate of 20%. Capital losses have to be declared within four years and be, can be carried forward indefinitely. Uh, we do have to be mindful of the capital gains tax pooling rules. Uh, so can a cryptocurrency gain be a gambling gain? Realistically, for most taxpayers, this is going to be an almost impossible argument. Uh, firstly, from a factual point of view, it's very hard for a taxpayer to demonstrate that they are gambling. Uh, most taxpayers will have some sort of a strategy, however, however simple that may be. Uh, if you go online, there are crypto broker research reports. There are people discussing different trading ideas. Most people have some sort of a trading strategy. You'd have to trade almost blindly to say that you are gambling in cryptocurrency. The second problem is that there is very weak legal authority to support an argument that a, a taxpayer can gamble in cryptocurrency. Uh, the case law that exists relates to shares. Uh, there isn't a single case the taxpayer has won on this argument. There are a couple of very very minor statements in cases a long time ago. There's not a lot of legal authority to support a, a gambling argument. And even if the taxpayer succeeded with their gambling argument, they'd be caught by the capital gains tax legislation. And you can read more about that in my, in my book. Um, the title is at the bottom of this slide and it's also at the end of these slides. Uh, there is one exception. If the taxpayer relied on HMRC's guidance when they filed their tax return, prior to 31 December 2018, excuse me, uh, the HMRC's guidance at that time was that a, gam a gain was a gambling gain, then the taxpayer could treat their gain, gain as being a gambling gain and free from tax. That is really the only realistic situation a taxpayer could treat their gain as a gambling gain and tax free. Uh, the second possibility is that they, a gain or loss is a trading gain or loss. Uh, the, the 
um, whether somebody is trading or not is impressionistic. It is if if you were to argue the matter before a tribunal, every judge um, it is a it is a matter of impression for the particular judge hearing that case. It is possible that different judges could reach different conclusions, even based on the same facts. They have a margin of discretion as to what constitutes trading, and these decisions are very hard to challenge on appeal. Essentially, there are four things that the taxpayer needs to demonstrate. They conducted the activity on a full-time basis. Uh, you know, they did it at least five days a week. Uh, you know, trading part-time or at the weekends will not fulfil that criteria. Uh, secondly, they had some sort of a trading strategy and they stuck to it. Uh, third, they did some basic bookkeeping. And four, they had a business plan, preferably a written business plan. An interesting example of this is the case of Ali and HMRC in 2016. Mr Ali was a pharmacist. He ran a pharmacy business and he moved into an office upstairs and traded shares full time. He got someone in to run his business. Uh, he made losses of around £2 million over four years. And when he sought to claim those losses, well, HMRC sought to deny him the use of those losses. Uh, he, he maintained that he was trading and he, he got through in the tribunal by the skin of his teeth. He showed he was conducting the activity on a full-time basis. He had a very basic strategy of, of relying on broker research reports and executing 30 to 40 transactions a day based on those reports. He did some basic bookkeeping and he articulated an oral business plan at the tribunal. The tribunal was sympathetic to him. He was very lucky. So he got through by the skin of his teeth, um, you know, that, that is an example of a, a uh, where a taxpayer succeeded with an argument they were trading, um, but yeah, Mr. Ali really got through by the skin of his teeth in that case. And the third possibility is that a gain or loss is a capital gain or loss, and realistically, for most individuals, this will be the correct treatment. Uh, the big challenge here is the capital gains tax pooling rules. There is software available that you can calculate gains and losses according to the pooling rules. And uh, it is advisable to use that for uh, somebody who is doing a lot of cryptocurrency trading. Uh, capital losses can only be used against capital gains. They need to be claimed within four years, but can be carried forward indefinitely. Uh, initial coin offerings. What are the taxation issues around initial coin offerings? Ideally, you want to establish the corporate entity from which the issuance will take place in a low tax jurisdiction. And you'll also want to have the entrepreneurs in a low tax jurisdiction. Um, this, this is so any profits that the corporate entity realises will be, will be taxed at a, a lower tax rate. And when an ICO is undertaken, typically the, the entrepreneurs who launch these project, projects get at least 20% of the tokens. If they're resident in the UK, they will be taxed as income on those tokens. And in some cases, that can be millions or tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, and ideally, we want the entrepreneurs um, who launch the ICO to be resident in a low tax jurisdiction. If the business has been established in the UK and it's necessary to transfer part of that business out, um, you know, there are challenges there. The intellectual property will be subject to tax charges. Um, it is possible to get it out, but it will be subject to a, a tax charge. Uh, there are lots of interesting VAT issues in relation to initial coin offerings. Um, the first is, how should the offering be characterised? Is it currency? If so, it'll be exempt from VAT. Or is it a voucher or a token for a, to redeem a good or service? Uh, if so, it will be subject to VAT. Uh, and there is then the issue of the timing of when VAT is payable. If it is a voucher, um, if it's a, either a prepayment or a single purpose voucher, VAT is payable on issuance. Otherwise, if it's a multi-purpose voucher, VAT is payable when the voucher is redeemed. This is important for the entrepreneurs because they would prefer a, a taxing point that is later in time, that is a cash flow advantage. So if the voucher is characterised as a single purpose voucher or a prepayment, um, they will be taxed up front. That is not, not a good outcome for the, the entrepreneurs, the, the ICO issuers. They really want it to be a multi-purpose voucher if that's possible. Uh, and where, are the, where is the place of taxation? Generally, it will be uh, the jurisdiction of, of the people who are acquiring these tokens. 
So if the issuance is taking place, it, it could be it could be multiple jurisdictions, which is a which is a nightmare if the if the tokens are taxable. But the the place where DAT is due is where the person who acquires that token is resident. Uh, a little bit more on VAT, cryptocurrency that is used as, as currency is exempt from VAT, cryptocurrency used to purchase or tokens used to purchase a good or service is subject to VAT in the usual way. Mining activities are outside the scope of VAT and not subject to VAT. Now, non-fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens were the biggest crypto issue of 2021. What is a non-fungible token? In this slide, I've started with the Oxford Dictionary definition of what fungible means. Fungible means replacement by another identical item, mutually exchangeable. So non-fungible is a completely unique token. It is not identical to any, it is, it is not identical to any other token, and it is based on blockchain technology. We're chiefly seeing NFTs in the art markets. 90% uh, of their NFTs relate to artwork and they're allowing artists to tokenize their artwork and sell their artwork online. Uh, Christie's sold the digital artwork every day is the first 5,000 days in 2021 to 69.3 million US dollars. Uh, you know, e NFTs are becoming a, a big business. It remains to be seen whether it stays that way, but there is an enormous amount of interest in NFTs at the minute. Uh, NFTs, in a, the, the reason there is so much interest in NFTs is that they enable an orderly online marketplace to be established for art. They enable the buyer to get clear title to the artwork. They, it, they enable the buyer to trace back and prove the provenance of the artwork. And the artist receives a royalty every time the token is on sold. Uh, it remains to be seen whether NFTs will continue to commercialise online art in this way, but th that is why there is so much interest in NFTs at present. Uh, what are the tax issues in relation to NFTs? Gains and losses are taxed as discussed earlier in the presentation. In general, they will be taxed as capital gains and losses. It is possible they could be taxed as trading gains or losses for somebody trading them, but realistically for most taxpayers, they will be taxed as capital gains and losses. Uh, there are lots of interesting VAT issues. Uh, VAT will generally be due on the sale of an, of an artwork in the usual way. Uh, the place of taxation is potentially very complicated Generally, it will be where the person who, if it's purely electronic, it will be the place where the person who acquires that token is resident. Uh, if it is a physical asset, um, we, if it is a physical asset, it may be different. It may be the, the place of supply where the person who owns that artwork is um, supplying that good. Um, it's, it's a big headache for online, marketplace, online marketplaces that sell a lot of goods electronically, like purely electronic NFTs, because it means they have to register in multiple jurisdictions. Um, it is a compliance nightmare, and there are, there are lots of penalties for, for non-compliance with, um, with the legislation for online marketplaces. Lost private keys. What happens if a taxpayer loses their private key? Well, they want to make, uh, if they lose their private key, they effectively lose their cryptocurrency, which is a, a bad thing. The only good thing that could come out of this is that they, they should be able to make a negligible value claim. They should be able to claim a capital loss on their tax return. They need to be able to demonstrate to HMRC that there is no possibility of recovering from their, their private key. It is not backed up anywhere. And so, so it's not written down. Uh, um, so that is, uh, that is pressure to uh, making a negative value plan. And staking and, lending, staking and lending of crypto assets, what are the big tax issues here? Uh, generally, any income received on the lending of a crypto asset or any tokens that are received will be treated as miscellaneous income and taxable. Uh, this is a, the challenge here is that many taxpayers, uh, they may, re, may be receiving staking income on crypto they have lent, but the value of the crypto they have lent fluctuates wildly 
and they may be in a position when uh, where they are they have a tax bill that is higher than the cryptocurrency um, that they have after they've completed the transaction because the value of the cryptocurrency they have loaned has dropped so much. Uh, at the minute, there is no definitive answer to this question. Um, and hopefully an arrangement will be reached with HMRC. But um, it's a question of watch for further guidance on that issue. The other big issue here is that when a taxpayer lends their crypto assets into a crypto pool, that will generally be a change of beneficial ownership. Many people don't realise that, but that is actually a taxable event. Um, it's a big problem because as the, as the assets are lent and uh, as they're transferred back to the taxpayer, those events will constitute tax, taxable events on which a capital gain or loss is realised. Uh, it is very problematic. There are likely to be high levels of non-compliance um, in this area. Non-domiciled individuals, this is one of the biggest issues in the taxation of individuals and inheritance tax. Can a non-domiciled individual treat their cryptocurrency as being a non-UK asset and get access to the non-domiciliary regime? In relation to inheritance tax, UK resident but non-domiciled individuals are taxable only on their UK assets. They are not subject to inheritance tax on their non-UK assets. Um, so the question is, is cryptocurrency a UK situated asset? Unfortunately for inheritance tax, for a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, the better answer is that it is probably a UK asset. For other types of cryptocurrency, so for example, Ripple, there is a good argument that it is a non-UK asset. It is, it is probably situated in the US where Ripple servers are. And for other types of cryptocurrency that reference an underlying asset that is offshore, those will also likely be non-UK assets. Um, a, a, another solution, if you, for, for realistically, for most clients holding a, most taxpayers holding a decentralized cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, for inheritance tax, it will be a UK asset. Uh, a way around this problem is to hold that asset through an offshore company or trust, probably a trust. Um, and yeah, that is the, the best way to try and make it a non-UK asset. Uh, Non-domiciled individuals and capital gains, the, the, the rules are slightly different for non-domiciled individuals in relation to capital gains and the, the, the situs of their assets. Uh, there is an argument each way as to whether Bitcoin could be a UK or non-UK asset under the, the capital gains tax rules. The, the better view is that it is probably a UK asset, but there is an argument that it could be a non-UK asset and it is possible a non-domiciled individual might be able to treat it as a, a non-UK asset. Similarly for other assets, uh, Ripple would probably be a, a non-UK asset um, and a token that refer references uh, an offshore asset would also be a non-UK asset. Um, you know, it's an extremely complicated area. You're probably, you're best to seek advice before taking a position in relation to these matters. Uh, what are the hot litigation issues in cryptocurrency? Initial coin offerings. Uh, what is the point at which BAT is payable on the coins that are issued? We've already had a couple of cases on that. So that's a hot issue. VAT on NFTs. Uh, the taxation of NFTs is very complicated. There is luck there be litigation in relation to NFTs, particularly on when and where VAT is payable. Uh, for individuals, the big issues are, well, particularly for non-domiciled individuals, the rumour is that HMRC is looking for a test case on this and they're likely to litigate the issue of whether certain cryptocurrencies are UK assets or non-UK assets at some point. Um, so that is, a, that is a hot litigation issue. Uh, the taxation of trading gains or losses, it's similar to the issues that arise for the taxation of trading gains or gains and losses in relation to shares, but we'll probably see cases on this as well. We may see a case on whether a taxpayer can claim the, the gambling, they treat their gains as being tax-free on the basis that they are gambling gains. Um, and my final thoughts, uh, cryptocurrency, crypto assets are here to stay. Uh, from an investment point of view, Bitcoin is now seen as a hedge against inflation. And this is why there is so much interest in cryptocurrency at the minute. 
uh, it, you know, it remains to be seen whether that will be the case for the future. In terms of the here and now, it is super hot and it is seen as a hedge against inflation. In relation to payments, uh, Facebook um, was the most visible proponent of this. They've sold their DM project. We'll need a major technological breakthrough, but it may still be possible cryptocurrency could be used as a form of payment. Um, and yeah, the taxation of cryptocurrency raises many interesting issues that we've discussed in the, in the presentation. Uh, and if you'd like to read more about the, the tax implications of cryptocurrency, please buy a copy of my book. Um, a link to it appears in this slide. That's great. Thanks, Ben. If anyone would like to take down Ben's contact details, they are on uh, the slide that's on screen now, or they will be up again towards the end of the webinar, so I don't feel rushed to note them all down now. Um, I'm sure that's really helped, Ben, many of our viewers try and at least understand the taxation of crypto a bit better and what key areas they need to be looking at. In terms of accountancy and my favourite subject, how is this all going to impact your tax return? So these are just the four key issues that we've seen that have impacted our clients in particular. Um, as Ben mentioned, the big one is, is it trading or capital? In most cases, it will be a capital transaction. So capital gains tax rules will apply. The usual allowances and exemptions are still there if you're entitled to them. But just bear in mind that there is still um, a small possibility that this might be classed as a trading activity. Record keeping really is the big one. You would think that because we're dealing in um, digital things when it comes to crypto assets and NFTs, that record keeping would be fantastic with it all being electronic. But really, um, I feel like that's the place where it's letting us down. Um, with a lot of the exchanges, you do need to regularly download transaction histories and they don't help towards calculating the gains or the losses that you've made or amalgamating different exchanges into one place to make it easily accessible. So I think Ben mentioned earlier that there are um, other software providers that do link in with the exchanges that will pull all of the information together in one place. They will help you calculate the, the pooling rules in a similar way to, you do, to how you do with shares. And from some of them, I've actually seen that they will provide you with an end of year summary for gains or losses. So if you are making substantial transactions, perhaps daily, they can really be worth the investment. Um, but I know that some of them are actually free as well. Reporting in pounds, um, in terms of your UK tax return, the figures do need to be reported in pounds, whether or not the underlying transaction took place in pounds. So a lot of the cryptocurrencies, um, they are linked to the dollar, which means even though you might have a full record keep in history, say, for example, of the, the value of your portfolio on the date that you sold it, you do also need to convert that figure to pounds. So it's important to find an exchange rate for that day of the transaction and also ensure that you're obtaining the exchange rates from a similar source each time so that there aren't some big variances. And finally, there's a lot of times when you may actually have a tax liability, but not necessarily the cash to pay the tax liability. The time that's in this happened most frequently is when people sell one type of crypto and then invest in another type of crypto straight away. Um, just because the money's tied up doesn't mean that the tax liability isn't payable. You can come um, to an arrangement with HMRC where you may be able to pay in instalments, but as with many instalment plans, there will be interest to pay at HMRC's approved rate. So it is important to take advice before you get into um, a large number of transactions or a large value of transactions, just to make sure that you're um, taking any potential tax liability into account. So a big thank you, first and foremost, to Asim and Ben for taking the time out to be with us today um, and for Ben's fantastic presentation, some of his um, pictures and icons I'm very jealous of. <laughs> and thank you all to joining us um, for this webinar. We'll take questions now. 
So I have been noting a few down as we've been going through the webinar. Um, so I'll start with you, Sim, because this was one of the early questions that came in. Um, and someone's asked, are the crypto exchanges actually giving information to HMRC if HMRC are asking them for it? Uh, yes, I believe so. Um, I'm, it's not clear what exactly what information they've given. Um, I suspect they haven't given full details of individuals' portfolios and whatnot, but um, they have given information of individuals who have substantial crypto holdings. And um, out of the latter part of last year, uh, the letters from HMRC started arriving, uh, urging those crypto investors to um, give some consideration to the tax liability that they may be subject to. So yes, they are, they are giving over information. Lovely, thank you. Um, then someone was particularly interested in the non-domiciled section that you were talking about and has asked if a non-domiciled person can shield their crypto gains from UK tax in any way. Yeah, uh, on the capital gains tax side, this is where taxpayers have the best opportunity to try and argue that a crypto asset is a non-UK asset. Uh, for a decentralised cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, there's an argument each way. HMRC possibly has the better argument so that, you know, it would take a taxpayer with a, a greater appetite for risk to take that position. But there is an argument that a decentralised cryptocurrency like Bitcoin can be a non-UK asset for the purposes of the non-domiciliary regime. Uh, other cryptocurrencies, for example, Ripple, there is a good argument that Ripple is a non-UK asset. Uh, and a token that references an underlying offshore asset, um, there is a good argument, again, that that is a, a non-UK asset. So uh, for, for, you know, for many cryptocurrencies, there will be a, a decent argument that the, uh, the cryptocurrency is a non-UK asset and a non-domiciled individual could use the uh, non-domiciliary regime. It's, it's probably best to take advice before taking a position. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just answer this one quickly because it's just come in, uh, but I touched on it in my section. Um, someone's just asked for clarification as to um, what they can do if they don't have the cash to pay the tax liability. Um, so I did mention that you can set up a payment plan with HMRC. They are real people at the end of the telephone at the end of the day. So as long as you call them up with a, with a realistic offer, as to the time frame and the amount of the instalments that you want to pay, they can be quite reasonable. Um, generally, I've seen as long as it's within 12 months, they're unlikely to say no. Um, you, some people might have heard that there are situations where you campaign instalments over a lengthy period of time. Um, but generally, those are where you're expecting to receive cash in instalments. They might not apply in the terms of crypto. Um, then there's another one that came in for you as well. Um, this person asked, if I'm expecting a big gain, is there anything I can do to mitigate that? So, for example, um, they've mentioned the spouse transfer for shares that they hold. Could they use something similar for crypto? Yeah, the, the, the spousal exemption is available for cryptocurrency as well. Um, the spousal exemption is probably the main thing I can think of. Uh, if you have capital losses, you could look to offset your capital losses against a gain. Um, and I guess the only other possible thing is maybe trying to use the, the non-domiciliary regime to, you know, to shield those gains from, from UK taxation. You know, I, I, given all the, the, um, the debate about the non-domiciliary regime, you know, it's a matter of speculation how long that will last. But, yeah, those are the, the three possibilities. I think we can all agree it's very likely that the non-domicile rules will be seeing a little bit of a review sometime in the near future. Um, I assume this one might be best for you. Um, how easy is it to buy a house if you're using crypto? Do you need a specialist solicitor or could you use anybody? Um, well, it is possible to buy a house using crypto directly. Uh, that brings about its own challenges. For example, you need to find a seller who is comfortable accepting crypto, but it can be done and it has been done. Um, 
but by far and large, the most common way uh, that we're seeing people looking to buy substantial assets such as property is by liquidating their crypto into fiat and then using that fiat to then uh, purchase a property. Uh, in which case, uh, yes, you would need to instruct the solicitor who is uh, fairly comfortable with crypto. Uh, and the reason for that is that they would typically need to form a report on the source of funds to satisfy anti-money laundering requirements. So the money laundering re regulations make it a legal requirement for us to verify the providence of funds being used to buy a property. And the nature of crypto uh, and the fact that law is quite an antiquated industry means that not many firms have the expertise to do so. And so um, we're coming across in practice many times where people have been turned away from their firms who are acting on their purchase uh, because they weren't comfortable with crypto. As we have a dedicated crypto team within the firm, uh, we do have the records of experience and fluency in this area to be able to do so. Um, so yeah, the, the, the answer to that is, yeah, you would, you would be better served by finding a solicitor who is comfortable uh, in crypto. Brilliant, thanks Asim. This seems like a good time while we're just answering the last few questions for me just to flip to the last slide where the contact details are so that if anyone does want to take down Ben or Asim's details, now you've got a little bit more chance to write those down. In terms of the questions we've got left, Ben, the negligible value section um, of your slides has really raised a few questions. So I think a lot of our viewers have perhaps lost, lost the keys, um, no longer got access to the wallets. So um, the question I've seen a few times is if someone's lost their key, how do they make a negligible value claim? Yeah, I mean, the negligible value claim can just be made on the tax return. Uh, HMRC do ask that um, you, you have some sort of proof that you, you won't be able to recover the key. That is, you haven't backed it up anywhere and you haven't written, written it down anywhere. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, you know, yeah, you should make that disclosure. There is, there is a section on the tax return to, to make that disclosure and, you know, you should really put that information on the tax return that the, the private key is not backed up anywhere and it is not being written down anywhere. It, it has... There, there is no way of recovering that key. That's great, thanks. Um, the, the other big negligible value question is, um, do, do people have to ask HMRC to confirm a negligible value before they put it on their tax return or can they just put it on the tax return? It is self-assessment. So um, they, they don't need permission from HMRC. Um, it, it is self-assessment. Uh, if, if if you're in, in in an ambiguous situation, you might be able to approach HMRC, and uh, there is you know there is no way to get a, a ruling or a, a statutory clearance, but they it's possible they may give um, an informal clearance or, or possibly even a formal clearance. Um, but really, you know, um, the, the, the tax system is self-assessment, so it is really for the taxpayer to satisfy themselves that they, they haven't backed the private key up anywhere and they haven't written it down anywhere. And, you know, that should be sufficient. It should be just sufficient for the taxpayer to make a declaration that they haven't written their private key down anywhere and they haven't backed it up anywhere. That should be satisfactory. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I am aware that I've had Ben and Asim talking for quite a while now, so I think we'll draw a line under the questions at that point. I think we've, we've answered the majority of the questions that were asked. Um, if you did have a question that we haven't been able to pick up on, do feel free to take down our contact details. You can contact either Ben, myself or Asim, either by email or telephone. Otherwise, thank you everyone for joining us. And as I said, we will send out a recording of this webinar in the coming days. Thank you.